Okay, good morning everyone. Um, we're 20 minutes behind schedule already, so we'll start. Um, like I said, you're in workshop 97, uh, concepts of acceptable behavior to enhance trust. Um, over the last few decades, the internet has developed from a small network connecting computers to exchange data into a global media, all co encompassing, uh, where people interact, socialize, work together, and exchange all kinds of information. It has become crucial in our lives and very, very important to our economies. It still hasn't grown to its full potential, although we have over two billion people online these, these times. And one of the things that is limiting its potential is trust, a factor that can make it grow and a factor that can make it fail. And it's trust of the users in its always being there, in their data being protected, in their possibilities to... You have no audio? Do you have audio? Yes. Okay. Um, and their possibilities to access the internet and um, get information and distribute information. This workshop tends to um, work on the concept of acceptable behavior, work that started um, last year in London with the International Cyber Conference and work that was uh, continued by the UK um, Internet Governance Forum and um, was also continued in this year's uh, International Cyber Conference. Um, the, what we will do is we will have a um, 45 minute of interaction with the panel and after that we will have um, an open discussion. Um, we will have to see about our time because, we've, like I said, we've lost already 20 minutes. My name is Rolf Meijer, by the way. I'm the CEO of SIDN. SIDN is the registry for the Netherlands country code top level domain .nl. Um, I'll start with introducing the panel to you and I'll do it um, just from left to right, if that's okay. Um, by the way, the information is on the screen as well. I have Dixie Holton here from Global Partners and Associates. And she's also the chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles. I have Mary Oduma. She's a colleague of mine, in fact. Um, she, um, she is the, the president of the executive board of the Nigeria Internet Registration Association, responsible for the operation of .ng, the Nigeria CCTLD. I have Jamie Saunders, director of the International Cyber Policy, UK Foreign Commonwealth Office. And then I have Professor Flavio Rek Wagner, um, he is uh, from the Federal University of Rio Grande, the SUL, and he's also a member of the multi-stakeholder Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. And then I have another colleague of mine here, Leslie Cowley, the CEO of Nominet, the registry for the UK, cctilde.uk. Um, I think I'll start with you, Jamie, um, as you were involved in last year's International Cyber Conference, where this work was taken up, and you were also involved in this year's Cy International Cyber Conference, as well as the UK um, IGF. Uh, can you tell me where we are now, and where this work is going to, and when you will be satisfied, when you will be happy with the results, because you've been tasked with this job? Uh, thanks, Rolf. We'll come back to the when I'll be happy, uh, perhaps at the end and in discussion. Um, but maybe to kick us off, I'd just like to focus on governments, um, some, some of the issues as we see them, and some possible ways of mapping a way forward. I think it's important to start um, with some basic realities which inform this debate from a government perspective. Um, the first one is that governments um, have to develop domestic policies um, on the internet which enable us to tackle crime and to protect national security. Um, we have to do that obviously in a way that respects uh, fundamental human rights, um, um, but there are some difficult trade-offs in that space and we can't ignore that. Uh, the second reality check um, is that we can't divorce cyberspace entirely from the reality of state-on-state uh, -state conflict. States um, will and do um, act in cyberspace to protect their national security interests, and we can't get away from that. Um, 
finally, at the same time, states do recognize the need to collaborate and tackle uh, threats in cyberspace, which have little respect for national borders, as we know. But there are some very different views about that. So the challenge in terms of agreeing norms of acceptable behavior is that those issues, how to strike the right balance in domestic policy, um, how to manage conflict between states, and what framework we should use for international cooperation, are all hotly contested. Um, and building international consensus around that is very, very hard. That's why we had the London Conference and the Budapest Conference, to try and see if we could find some uh, common, common ground. Um, I think there are a number of reasons to be hopeful that we can make progress on this. The first is, whilst we can't divorce um, cyberspace from the hard realities of state-on-state -state, uh, competition, there are a lot of agreements which we've already made on human rights, on laws of armed conflict, um, and on trade, which I think can form the basis. Um, of progress and the key issue to me there is to get the broadest possible consensus that these international standards apply in cyberspace as much as they do in the real world and that has a lot of uh, positive uh, practical things can fall from that. I think the second reason to be hopeful is that the economic and social benefits of cyberspace are there for all to see and they're now touching nearly every corner of the world. And whilst it's true there's plenty more to do to ensure those benefits are shared equitably, the key point is that no one actually wants to put that at risk. Um, and in particular, despite differences of view um, in terms of how the internet should be managed at the domestic and international level, very few want to see the environment fragmenting completely um, because the value of inter um, international connectivity is simply too great. And then the third uh, reason I have uh, for hope is that because our uh, dependence on cyberspace is growing, um, there are really in real incentives on countries to cooperate in tackling threats. Um, that means that states have an interest in uh, acting cooperatively, but it also injects a certain degree of caution in terms of state activities and provides incentives on states to work together to develop confidence-building measures, norms of acceptable behavior uh, that will reduce the risk of unintended consequences, miscalculation, or the escalation of conflict from cyberspace into the real world. <coughs> so the final point I question I'd make is uh, how we take this debate forward and particularly how the IGF can play its role. Um, the first thing I'd say is governments clearly don't have all the answers. Uh, business have built the internet and business needs to tell us what kind of behaviours will best preserve the environment on which we all depend and what kind of activities are likely to put that environment at risk. Civil society has a big role in uh, developing common positions from the perspective of the citizen and in holding governments to account. And I think that uh, civil society can often help us break through um, some of the entrenched positions which governments tend to hold. Um, my view is that the current debate on international security aspects of this is, is too dominated by governments um, and positions can become easily entrenched and if in this session we can develop some mechanisms to make the multi-stakeholder voice heard then I'm very keen to help establish a way to get that voice injected into the various intergovernmental discussions that are taking place on this subject. So if I understand correctly, your, your main goal is to get this into a multi-stakeholder discussion. Um, I think this is, this, this is going to be the fourth, yeah, the fourth time do you, that you talk about this, uh, twice this year, um, in the Budapest and in your UK IGF, and last year in the London International Cyber Conference. Can you give us a brief um, idea of what progress has been made on the subject during those discussions, where you were and what were the main things that you managed to obtain from the discussions? 
Um, well, the first thing I'd say um, is that when we discussed this in London, it was in a closed session, just governments alone, um, which maybe was the right thing at the time, I wouldn't like to say. Um, but in Budapest, we took that first step to actually int inviting uh, multi-stakeholderism into that very government-dominated uh, event. And there was a very useful workshop where we heard from ISOC, from the ICRC, and from business. Um, and uh, from uh, other um, civil society voices um, to begin to put that perspective into the debate. The purpose of London and Budapest isn't to do the negotiation itself, it's really to report progress up to senior uh, governmental levels. The main debate now is happening in the UN um, in the OSCE and in the ASEAN Regional Forum and we as governments are taking the input that we're getting from the UK IGF, from the, uh, the sessions at Budapest into those fora um, and championing the views of uh, those bodies. I think in terms of progress, I mean progress is very slow, but I'm increasingly confident that that basic foundation stone of acceptance that international humanitarian law applies in cyberspace as much as it does in uh, anywhere else. There's a uh, growing consensus around that, and I think that's going to be the key that unlocks this debate. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, our last panelist have um, arrived, so I'd like to introduce Robert Schlegel to you. He's a member of the Russian uh, Federation Parliament. He's also a member of the Russian State Duma Commission on Information Policy, Information Technology and Communications. Welcome. Um, are you ready? Because you're the second in my line. Yeah? Okay, there will be um, a simultaneous translation from Russia into English, so you will have to use your headset for that. Um, well, you being from, from a country's parliament, I'm sure that you have a, um, a responsibility uh, towards the public, um, and then also you're, um, as a politician you will have an opinion on um, how uh, to define um, acceptable behavior um, and in the context of the internet on, on how to arrive at defining um, acceptable behavior. Um, I have understood that um, the Russian Federation has a, has a proposal that is, that is more formal than what Jamie proposes, yeah, have an, have an um, international multi-stakeholder approach. Maybe you can explain a bit about the way that you see it. Uh. Good day, colleagues. Good morning. I would permit myself to speak in Russian. I would like to ask just several minutes. Sorry, I was late. I have a presentation, and I would like to demonstrate this presentation. And I have it in my hand. Hands. Uh, just, just, just leave me some minutes, uh, some free time uh, that I, I would, you know, right now display my presentation. Is it okay with you? Of course, I have my own standpoint about the problems that we have uh, right now started to discuss. But let me just, you know, to put on the on the, on the display my presentation. Thank you. Which to you then? In the meantime. Um, you're, you're from a country where um, um, quite some bad traffic has originated from. Um, not that it's your fault, but um, um, it was caused by individuals, of course, but I think the, the whole country got into a, a difficult position because of that. Unacceptable behavior. Um, can you tell us something about your experiences and, and your opinion on how this should be solved? Okay, thank you. and. Um, um, I, I just want to echo some of the... Can you hear me, please? Yes, okay. I can. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, um, unacceptable behavior, whether it's online or offline, I, I think they have the same consequences. And my country, uh, Nigeria, has witnessed a lot of traffic coming out from our domain uh, and um, um, building, uh, threatening the, the trust on internet. And uh, it has so affected us that um, sometimes our, tra our traffic, the, our IP is profiled most time because um, the bad guys, few of them that are 
uh, that have uh, been behaving badly on the cyberspace um, have brought about um, a, a, an economic downturn to us. Because, for instance, um, um, we have witnessed uh, universities' um, IPs blocked because there was a bad behavior on that IP. Uh, we have also seen uh, our e-commerce not growing because um, uh, people don't trust the, the cyberspace. Um, majority of people in Nigeria has refused to, to use the ATM because they are not sure that um, their, their identity will not be stolen. And uh, we have had a case, it, it's gotten to a case of um, using the internet to even kill. There was a case of a, a, a Cynthia in Nigeria that she was killed because she chatted on uh, some bad, with bad guys on the internet and she was lured to a hotel room and uh, she was killed. So it, it's gotten as bad. It's not only financial aspect of bad behavior, there is the moral aspect of bad behavior, there is the commercial aspect of bad behavior. Um, sometimes you send um, a, a commercial transaction and the IP is traced to Nigeria. Some of them are not honored. Our, our credit cards might not be honored. So those are the downturn of bad behavior on the internet. But the good news is that um, in Nigeria we have, um, we have taken the bulls by the hand. First, we, have, we, have, we are cooperating with gov other governments. Uh, I know that the EU has been training uh, law enforcement agencies in, uh, in the aspect of um, uh, countermeasures and uh, preventive measures on cyberspace. We have what we call Economic and Financial Crime Commission, that's EFCC. They've also received a lot of training and cooperation. But we are cooperating so much that um, some of the bad guys are being apprehended and uh, the law enforcement, they are taken to court. But for the fact that we have not passed a cyber uh, crime bill, so um, um, it has not been too effective. But um, we have some that has happened. There are some that have been apprehended and uh, they are being, um, being questioned and even taken to court. But we, we have also uh, changed our evidence act so that now in the court you can use, um, you can bring the e-evidence and not only hard evidence. We have passed the information, um, 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 information bill, uh, freedom of information bill as well, which is uh, helpful for people to extract information. Um, our central bank has been um, um, putting up um, what we call um, buyers be away of what whom you are dealing with, and uh, for that reason, um, when uh, some spam mails are sent to you, you should please do a check before you do that. You know. um, the economic and financial, the cyber security bill or cyber crime bill is on. There's a working group that is, um, and is being led by the law enforcement agencies, and they are, they are doing a lot uh, on, that, on that side of it. And uh, there's a national set where we can report bad behaviors on the internet. And during our national IGF, it was one of the things that we discussed, the government, the civil society, the academia, and the, and the industry, we all came together to discuss on what to do to improve behavior of our users, our internet users. But let me also say that sometimes when there's a bad behavior on internet and, you, and it is from Nigeria, uh, you trust the IP and it's not from Afrinic. It's not even the IP of Nigeria. It might come from Europe, it can be from China, it can be from Russia. So uh, that's the openness of the internet. That's the, 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 the aspect that uh, worries us because, um, um, because of proxy IPs or proxy domain names, it, it becomes very difficult for uh, law enforcement agencies. But the truth is that Nigeria is ready to cooperate from government, civil society, academia, they are all ready to cooperate with, um, with other international organizations to see how we can counter or prevent bad behavior on the internet. Actually, 
whether on cyberspace or offline, bad behavior is bad behavior, and we do tackle that uh, in our own way. But we, we hope that very soon the, the cyber uh, security bill or cyber crime bill will be passed because there's a coalition where people that are we sign up there are a lot of us that sign up to the coalition of passing the, the bill we have had consultation on the bill and uh, we hope that very soon it will be passed and um, uh, we, we 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 agree with others on how to cooperate and fight the bad behavior on the internet I will, I will see other things in the second round. Let me just stop here. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, Dixie, I'll, I'll switch to you because we are still having a problem with um, Robert's presentation. Um, you're also the co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition that works on internet rights and principles. Um, I have the two slides with them here if you want them up on the, um, on the screen, yeah? I've also put lots of copies at the back of the room okay. if anyone wants to grab so a copy. So do you think that there, that there, um, that there is a, a use for those rights and principles in this discussion? Can we use them as a starting point or can I have your opinion on that? Certainly. Um, well, yes, in a word. <laughs> so. <laughs> so the uh, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition is a network of individuals and groups from across the world who basically are extremely excited about the internet because we see it as a space with enormous public value to citizens in terms of the right to expression, the right to association, to assembly, being able to access information on a scale never before seen in history. But the same, we recognize lots of dangers online, some of which comes from bad behavior of other users, as um, my Nigerian lady fellow mentioned, but also um, some of which w comes from companies and some of which comes from uh, governments as well. And we see things like um, mass surveillance without due process um, or censorship or internet shutdown. So there's, there is a vast range of um, dangers out there. And the approach of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition is that in order to um, ensure that the public value of the Internet is promoted and that the dangers are protected against, we should embed our Internet governance and our Internet policy making in human rights standards. Um, so the work of the coalition over the last five or six years has really been to think through how existing human rights standards apply in the internet environment. Um, it's an evolving document. It's gone through about three or four different formations so far, and it's still not at a final um, space. It's called the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. Um, and in 2010, as a coalition, we decided to take that charter and to really distill it down to 10 core uh, internet rights and principles, which is on the document at the back of the room, so I won't read them out. Um, the reasons that we decided to distill it down is one, well, we had, it was done by a working group called the Punchy Working Group, so we wanted to make it a bit more punchy and have more effect, as the charter is actually quite a long, uh, document, but also um, as, as an extremely long and detailed con document, it was quite hard to get full agreement on every element of the charter, whereas the central concepts and the central values there was a lot of agreement over. So by kind of taking more of a top level approach, we were able to ensure greater consensus among the wide variety of people in the coalition. So I think that would be my first lesson from our experience for this initiative, is that we're not necessarily ready to agree on extremely detailed um, responses in the international level for every issue, but we can get some agreement over top level values. Um, two other lessons that I would like to share from our experience in the IRP coalition are both to do with the legitimacy of the, out, of the outcoming document. Um, one, one reason why I think this document has a lot of legitimacy and why we're called to present it to groups such as this is because it's based on human rights standards. 
Um, as Jamie mentioned, human rights standards um, are apply online as they do offline. 85 countries signed a resolution in, just in July making that simple but very powerful statement. Human rights do apply online as they applied offline. Uh, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that applies in every country in the world. In many ways, it is almost a global constitution and so it is right and it is proper that it should apply online too. And the second question of legitimacy comes from the actual process uh, with which the principles were formed, which was a very open process. Absolutely anyone w could uh, input and we actually took it out as well to as many different forums and, and spaces as we could to get input and consult with different groups, groups who were very friendly to our aims and also groups who were maybe less friendly to our aims. Um, we had, we were aiming for consensus as much as possible, which meant we had to have some very, very long discussions. Um, it was a multi-stakeholder process. We had involvement from across across the range of stakeholders, and it was global. Um, we there, we had people from well, every country was invited to uh, to feed in, and we had a, f a fairly representative um, lot of input. So, and I think. Especially on that last point around process, if you're looking at what kind of internet governance uh, principles are acceptable, I think we're finding it becoming more and more necessary to take this kind of open multi-stakeholder process if the outcoming document is to be seen as legitimate. Um, I think the question of whether we need top-level internet governance principles in the internet environment is, is yes. The answer is yes. I think lots of different stakeholders would agree with that, and we can see lots of documents to draw from. The 10 IRPs is definitely one, but we also have internet governance principles from the Council of Europe. We have um, internet policy making principles from the OECD. There are a number of different initiatives that we should draw upon rather than in reinventing the wheel. And in fact, there was a civil society meeting all weekend before the IGF, and one of the things that came out of that was a call for the IGF as a whole to try and start creating some of these top, uh, top level uh, IG, IG principles. And I think we should try and link these two initiatives. And um, my final comment at this point is just about the title. I really don't love the term acceptable behavior online. To me, it really... Um, really makes me think of some kind of paternalistic and, and sanitized approach to the internet that perhaps doesn't sit that comfortably with an open and free internet, but I'll just put that on the table for now. Thank you. Well, that was exactly the question I wanted to ask you, because um, you were approaching this from another angle. Uh, people's rights and principles um, is, is a different approach from what can I do and what shouldn't I do. Um, just apart from the title, um, what, what do you think about the discussion on, we can approach it that again from two sides. We can try to formulate what is acceptable behavior with, I think, the risk that everything we forget to come up with might then be considered unacceptable behavior. So maybe it's better to start with defining what we think is unacceptable, but is, is, that, is that the direction you want to go in or would you prefer to stick to rights and principles of people online? I definitely think that whatever approach you take has to be founded in human rights principles and has to respect human rights principles. So I would re agree with you on that, that it's uh, much safer to start from a defining unacceptable behavior. Um, if you look at the human rights framework, it does provide a framework for making the kind of balances that you're talking about for dealing with criminals or uh, appreciating a government's responsibility to protect its citizens. But what it does is it provides us with a framework for ensuring that the way that we deal with that does not end up actually undermining the actual values we're trying to protect. Um, and so I don't have a problem with us looking at how to tackle unacceptable bad behavior online. In fact, I think that is necessary and lots of people have real um, harm done to them by things online and I think it is definitely legitimate to look at how we can tackle that. 
but I think we need to ensure that we are tackling that in ways which sit within a human rights framework, and I think it's entirely possible to do that. Thank you. Robert, um, we managed to get your presentation up, so um, can we have your Don't perspective? Done. As a from the <laughs> um, yes, thank you. I ask everybody to put on headphones because I will speak in Russian. Um. I would. I have called uh, my short presentation Reality on Internet Development in Russia and Proposals for its Management and Security. I would like to draw your attention to the topics uh, that can be, can be seen broader at first sight because uh, what we are discussing today, today uh, in broader context, uh, it can generate a very and very different idea and approach. Uh, if, for the first time in our country, we have had the research and the, of RUNET, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately today the Russian Internet uh, is one of the um, fastest growing economy uh, internet space in the world. Uh, uh, we have 80 billion uh, dollars uh, uh, of usage of internet, so and, and this uh, this figure is increasing. Uh, we have uh, uh, domain is point or you. It implies you know large of or uh, a huge number of sites, and we have also started to use the Cyrillic the, the, the domains. Uh, and the 45 million internet users are uh, quite you know mm, you know uh, is active, so. so 39% of the Russian population is uh, 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 practically the half of the Russian population, so we are active internet users. So on the next uh, slide, you see, uh, as you see, that Russia is uh, about is uh, 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 is among top. 10 uh, countries of the world about, uh, in, in the field of broadband internet, so uh, we bring more and more uh, internet for our citizens, and we are aspiring uh, to ensure the best prices, uh, one megabit per second, uh, is used not only by youngsters, but also uh, by adults uh, so that, are, that have uh, more than th 30 years old, and, uh, and it seems that the public becomes more old ages, so I mean that the, the number of adults you of among internet users in Russia is increasing. That's also another trend. Uh, and in our legislation, we have had serious changes. Uh, in the last year, uh, we have introduced uh, the concept of site domain name hosting provider and a network uh, network uh, a provider, and uh, uh, we have a blacklist the law on blacklist. So was also you know used. Uh, in this, uh, in our case, but uh, in our slide, I would like to underline that you know we plan in years future to set uh, rights and obligations of uh, providers of hosters uh, and uh, they, uh, when you provide a domain name, as well as to, to, to define the territorial jurisdiction of the Russian Federation in all these cases. Uh, and I would even say that for the time being, so we also would like to uh, uh, use the system of open licenses, we would like to uh, strip um, the uh, responsibility of those who are have uh, infringed the uh, copyright, uh, uh, but uh, this has been done, this has not been done delibor deliberately, and uh, the, this will be mainly, uh, uh, unfortunately this is uh, this is the situation right now which traps us all in the in, in awkward situation, and uh, about the electronic democracy, so uh, uh, in uh, in, in, in Russia, we have the concept of the Russian uh, initiative, uh, which tells that uh, each address uh, that will have uh, more than 100,000 uh, votes, uh, so that will be debated in, in Russian Duma and in government. So I have been involved in this process in enabling internet users, and it is being it can be done not just you know in a capital city, but also in the region. It means that if the five percent of any of the town in Russian Federation, if they have casted their ballots through internet, so this is something that can generate 
the legislative initiative in the Russian parliament. Uh, so we are also using internet for uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the displaying the draft laws of Russian Duma when their citizens can go online also to see, to debate the draft laws and bring their own amendments. Uh, this is, uh, I, we think that uh, an, an important pillar of democracy and uh, I think uh, in principle uh, that's, that's our uh, plan for future and uh, I would like also to say, I would like to quote of Dmitry Medvedev uh, about the rights and freedoms. He said that it's necessary to create world principles of the work with the internet, which will take into consideration the unwanted points and include rules of which it should be developed. Uh, here with uh, the controlling you know, uh, constant, uh, constantly on the on this context is as impossible. That's that's the, that's the, the position, official position of Russia. Uh, and and it, uh, here I quote the Minister of Communication who was here. Internet is a, a fantastic opportunity of human communication, but at the same time, it has, thread, uh, it has the threats uh, and the challenges. Therefore, it's necessary to create some rules which would make the internet free for adults and safe for children. And it tells that at the level of minister, at the level of the minister of communication of the Russian Federation, there is a frustration, there is a concern. And uh, about the right, not only about the rights, but also about the safety uh, of, of uh, internet. And uh, here, I would like to touch upon uh, those ten principles, uh, 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 fundamental principles. Uh, there are three that will be in nearest future. In the nearest future, so will not be unac uh, unattainable equality of access to the internet. Yes, we can say in words, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it's very difficult to do it in reality. In Russia, there is a lot of geographic geographical locations. Uh, where you have different uh, l level of uh, life and the technical uh, possibilities are also different. Uh, therefore, the anonymity, it is in fact so we are uh, not going uh, uh, forward, we're going backward uh, because the cyber crime uh, is uh, uh, alarming us uh, in this case because uh, how we can define this or that man or woman uh, to identify uh, to, 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 to law the law uh, uh, violations uh, as well as a, a complete uh, privacy anonymity and the right to the free flow of information to political for political purposes you know uh, to influence the internal policy. This is uh, unfortunately takes place in Russia because uh, there are external circles, uh, because the free flow of information for pol political purposes, so that principle so will be very contradictory one. And uh, here I just came to the Black Lakes uh, starting from November 1. Just, just, just several days ago, the law on uh, creating so-called Black Lists, uh, the register of sites uh, that are offered by our citizens to be included uh, the uh, child pornography, the, uh, the, the, the diffusion of uh, drugs and the instigation of persons to suicide and uh, uh, unfortunately so we have already have, uh, have thousands and thousands of such addresses from citizens but uh, we have just taken just uh, the smallest percentage uh, and 79% of uh, citizens have been very active and very very pro very very active in this in, in this initiative, so, but we have uh, you know so far treated you know, just a small percentage of all these addresses. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, to call uh, to speak about the international position of Russian Federation. So this year, so uh, the Convention on ensuring the in international security. When we have the position of Russia, we think that the struggle against cyber crime should be done in a coordinated way in all uh, internet space, but without altering without violating the national sovereignty of state these are the principles uh, uh, that can uh, that can be somehow difficult uh, and uh, uh, for, for the next uh, so for, for, uh, what about the services internet services uh, as you see 47 percent of users uh, get information about the world news uh, 51 are users are getting involved for work and school 39 are taking the use about the entertainment uh, 37 percent you for for communication with their friends if we so speak about state service I, I'm just wrapping up 
up my 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 uh, my my speech. Uh, Fifteen million of Russians uh, use the state services in electronic form, starting from first January January 2013. Very soon we will uh, issue the electronic cards. Uh, that will settle the identity issues and we will, will be also used uh, uh, to have the direct democracy through internet uh, and we are creating the infrastructure and we are discussing right now the draft law in our parliament and uh, it's quite objective the next elections to parliament and the next election of president can uh, be also to somehow done using internet technology i think this will just do nothing but increase the number of uh, waters uh, and in my opinion uh, what uh, what next has happened in russia um in, in Russia, uh, the uh, the uh, main search engine uh, has even uh, the audience, uh, the number of audience has increased. The, uh, the number of audience of the federal channel, TV channel. Can you imagine that this is, you know, the, the users they prefer not to watch TV but to go to the internet, uh, and the number of internet users is increasing uh, uh, hugely in social networks. Uh, I think that the government should think. Uh, that the, the uh, how state services can be also provided via social networks uh, we are thinking about that uh, but we don't have a solution for the time being uh, and concerning the education uh, national education uh, system all schools are connected to internet so we have uh, one computer per each uh, each uh, per, per, per each 15 school children and uh, it uh, but uh, besides that so they have mobile uh, from mobile internet and uh, they have the tablets uh, and uh, uh, in, in our country so we have two uh, for, uh, uh, for mobile phones per capita we have the, also the uh, uh, di distance uh, learning uh, 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 which in fact very popular among the school teachers uh, which also helps uh, to uh, to increase the education possibilities as a final word I'd like to say about the remote medical care uh, all our hospitals uh, are connected to internet and uh, I, I, I would rather say the majority of them uh, uh, is, is connected uh, and I hope that all of them so will be fully connected next year and uh, I would like also to underline we had a huge inundation uh, mm, this year so uh, in the south of our country and internet has been actively used for volunteers uh, heading to rescue people who have suffered from inundation I think that uh, this will be also continued because internet today helps us to have uh, a third hand, uh, uh, literally, uh, to help children, to help those who are suffering in such situation because uh, uh, very different problems can occur uh, uh, in, as, as natural calamity. Uh, therefore, so it helps us you know, to, 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 to make this uh, struggle more effective. Thank you for your attention. And I have an email here displayed here so uh, we can. I am I'm ready for communication and for contacting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's clear that the Russian government is worried about um, the safety of the Internet for its users and working hard to, um, to improve the situation. What do, what do you think about um, this, this approach of a, an international multi-stakeholder discussion to define unacceptable behavior on the Internet? I, I haven't. No idea. One second. My attention. So, uh, if you ask my attitude about my attitude, I think uh, this is quite simple. Uh, I think we have to elaborate and respect the rules that are adopted uh, at international level and we have to uh, pay all our effort to hear each other. I mean, very often times it happens, I'm talking from my experience, we are declaring the possibility of dialogue, we are declaring that uh, this or that thing can be done, we have common targets, but in reality it's quite the opposite. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, the opinion expressed by one party is not taken into account seriously. Therefore, I think, first of all, we have to listen to each other.
That's what we have to aspire for. Thank you. That's, that's clear. Flavio, um, you're, you're, an, uh, you're a member of the Brazilian Internet Multi-Stakeholder Steering Committee. Um, you've heard quite a few different approaches to this. I know that Brazil has its own, I think, 10 uh, Internet principles. Um, what is your angle on this? Uh, well, uh, Brazil is uh, very much interested in uh, promoting a worldwide uh, multi-stakeholder approach for the development of a framework of acceptable behavior because it is following this approach uh, for many years at national levels and with great su success with a very positive answer from the various stakeholders in the country. So, uh, as you mentioned, and as many of you may know, uh, the .br country code is managed by a multi-stakeholder body, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, or CGI for short. And CGI has a board with 20 on, 21 members, 12 from civil society and uh, 9 from government. As you see, government does not have a majority of seats in the board. So CGI is responsible for all technical functions regarding the management of .br, but also other technical functions that help improve internet in the country. Among those functions, certainly many of them regard protecting and enhancing trust. And CGI also has a, a political role, important one. It is responsible for proposing policies and actions that are required for the development of the internet in the country. So not only a technical function, but also a very important political one. So, but CGI is not a regulatory agency. Except for those policies that are directly related to the management of .br, its policy recommendations are non-binding. So it works together with society, government, uh, even the Congress, uh, by education and outreach to put those policies forward. And I will give you just a few examples of success that are related to non-binding recommendations, to actions that derive it from those policy recommendations and from the multi-stakeholder approach uh, we follow in Brazil. So, first example, uh, CGI has created an anti-spam committee with the participation of many other stakeholder groups, not only those represented in the CGI board, and discussed and proposed actions and policies for fighting spam. The committee approved, for instance, a resolution regarding blocking of port 25. Although non-binding, this resolution has been followed by all associations of internet service providers in the country and then uh, recently by all telecom providers in the country. So the anti-spam committee also worked together with other associations, internet service providers, digital media industry, to put forward an email marketing self-regulation code, which is now implemented and followed by the country, by the whole society. As a second example uh, on the multi-stakeholder approach, CGI organizes together with other institutions a seminar on data privacy and protection of personal data, which is already in its third edition. Panelists come from various organizations of the civil society, from academia, from several governmental agencies. And the goals of this seminar are to discuss and propose policies and actions to be implemented or followed by the different stakeholders in their respective responsibilities. And I come to a third and last example, and maybe with the greatest impact. You mentioned CGI, after lengthy discussions, approved unanimously a set of ten fundamental principles for the use and governance of the Internet. And, of course, many of those principles are directly related to acceptable behavior on the net. Uh, this idea of developing fundamental principles using a multi-stakeholder approach has been also followed by the Brazilian National Congress. Civil society has been called and worked together with legislators intensively in many, many public hearings and also by open consultation through the Internet and developed the draft of the Internet Bill of Rights that expresses fundamental rights regarding the use of the Internet. And that shall be voted by the Congress very soon, maybe even today, as we are here. We are waiting for the uh, response from the Brazilian Congress on this voting. There are many articles in the bill that relate to norms of acceptable behavior, for instance, regarding privacy, data retention, net neutrality, responsibilities of, providing, of providers regarding contents, and so on. So, in conclusion, I give you just a few examples of how Brazil is following a multi-stakeholder approach to develop actions and policies that help protect and enhance trust. Although non-binding, those policies, because of the multi-stakeholder approach, are seen as legitimate by the Brazilian society. As a consequence, those policies are implemented or taken in consideration by the various stakeholders in their respective roles, 
industry, government, even the Brazilian National Congress. And because of this very positive experience at home, Brazil would like very much to get involved and to play a prominent role in an international initiative for developing a framework of ac acceptable behavior. And I am uh, pretty sure that Brazilian stakeholders will respond very positively to this challenge and will have a very active role in this initiative. Okay, thank you, Flavio. I see some support for another yeah. angle. Let's start with principles and rights first before we start talking about acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Yeah. Okay. Um, Leslie, you've been the CEO of Nominet since 2002, and I know um, also from the exchanges you and I have personally that um, over that time Nominet has taken a lot of initiatives to improve the safety and the security of um, not only the .uk domain, but uh, I think I know also the internet um, for the, the British internet users. Um, so what do you think of the initiative of your, your government? And, um, how do you think this should be put forward? Okay, thank you, Rolf. Um, never a good idea to disagree with an initiative of one's government. At um, least not of publicly. Course, no, not publicly. Um, so let, let me give you two hats for my contribution, um, just to get us started. Um, firstly, as nominate, and uh, then from the UK IGF that we had just the other week. Um, so as nominate, um, of course we take our uh, responsibilities um, incredibly seriously. And uh, one very good example of that in recent years is how we have been working with uh, our law enforcement in the UK um, where activity breaches our terms and conditions. Um, but we have found that that's a kind of a very blunt instrument towards dealing with some of the undesirable behaviors that damage trust um, and have for some time now been trying to develop some policy around how the registry should respond to criminal behaviors and that is through a multi-stakeholder process and as many in this room will, will know and recognize it's quite difficult to develop policy uh, particularly in a contentious area uh, through a multi-stakeholder process, but nevertheless, we, we've tried, and I think we're shortly going to be at the point where we have some UK policy on that. Um, and it's a difficult issue. We, we, we're not intending that Nominet acts for law enforcement or becomes law enforcement, uh, but equally we want to uh, meet our responsibilities in that area, particularly to the end user, and we want to ensure that people can retain trust in .uk. That's incredibly important. Um, as you said, I've been at Nominet for some time now, uh, and um, I'd just like to touch on one point that we often think about, is how whatever we develop to deal with trust or breaches of trust, how on earth that can scale. Um, so, you know, the speed at which harms can be committed on the internet is incredibly fast now but often our processes for dealing with those are incredibly slow. Um, and so some of my experience at Nominet has been around how do we scale things so we can be very efficient and very fast and, and help end users. And I think also some of that kind of learning needs to come into how we deal with harms on the internet um, as well. How we deal with things needs to scale. Um, Finally, just from a nominate point of view, I'd like to trust and uh, question the whole concept of a, a trusted internet. Um, you know, we, we teach people how to keep safe in an unsafe world, and, and you know, I have children, I know many here have children too. We, we, we teach them how to keep themselves safe. And yet, sometimes when it comes to cyberspace, we sometimes try to protect and cocoon people at times. Um, and I think much more effort needs to be put into uh, helping users and businesses to keep themselves and their systems um, safe. And so for me, any discussion about rights, and I, I like Dix's list, but to me it's missing another half, which is responsibilities. Uh, responsibilities of users. Uh, so you have rights but you also have responsibilities uh, too, and they may well be responsibilities to um, other users. 
So let me just briefly feed in um, some thoughts from the UK IGF, uh, which happened just the other week, in fact, and was one of the first national IGFs. And we had a discussion on exactly this topic, too. And we, were, um, we went back to the London Cyber Conference um, uh, and noted that you know, this really started uh, a conversation that may well run over several years. Um, we agreed that it was important that any regulation should be grounded in human rights agreements. That seemed to be a given within the UK. Uh, we talked about scaling, that any model should be efficient and effective. Um, but I think we, we highlighted a disagreement between openness and privacy um, and did agree that um, taking a multi-stakeholder approach to this conversation would be important um, and international cooperation would be important. It's all very well and good one nation uh, deciding upon things that, that really doesn't work unless this is a, an international uh, area. But then internationally, there's much potential for disagreement about what is actually acceptable. Um, what behavior is acceptable in the UK may well be different uh, as to what behavior is acceptable uh, in Russian or, Russia or, Ni or Nigeria. Um, so we questioned whether it's actually realistic to pursue consensus in this area. Um, are we actually aiming for something that's gonna be quite unreachable? I'm sure we'll have an interesting conversation on the way, but are we being realistic in, a, in our aspirations? That was the thoughts from the UK IGF. Sometimes it's not the goal that's the most important. It can be the, the experience along the way. Leslie, to you, is um, acceptable behavior or unacceptable behavior, is that the same as a criminal uh, and or unlawful, or is there a difference? Uh, so I guess I would see behavior as a spectrum and at one end there is criminal behavior which is totally unacceptable. Then at the other end of the spectrum there may well be uh, behavior that um, is not unlawful but is still nevertheless unacceptable to the individual. Uh, so we had um, some very good research presented in the UK recently by the Internet Watch Foundation, which was talking about children posting images online um, that were then reposted and out on the internet everywhere. They weren't what the, um, the original poster did not for any minute think that their image was going to be shared as widely mm. as it was. And that was unacceptable to them. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we take this further, um, you've been very patient with us. Um, any remarks from the room or questions, either to the panelists or in general? Leonid. Oh, quite a few. Um, I have the mic, I'm afraid. <laughs> Please um, state your name and your yeah. affiliate. Leonid Todorov, Coordination Center for .ru. Well, quite an impressive panel, I must say, and uh, quite uh, eye-opening in the sense that I've, I've, I see a whole spectrum, a whole range of uh, opinions uh, from, uh, from that uh, purely, I would say, European uh, through, let's say, very specific African and Russian. Uh, let me just uh, uh, note a very interesting point. I mean, uh, Robert, in your uh, presentation, uh, with all these impressive lists of uh, achievements and breakthroughs in Russia, what I found out was missing uh, two critical words, civil society. As a representative of the civil society, I must say that uh, the picture you portrayed for Russia was pretty much an omnipotent state taking care of each and every citizen without any reference to civil society initiatives, which should be further promoted uh, well, on the federal or regional or local level. And I think that this is one of those weaknesses of the system, which may hamper uh, free and open, uh, free development of uh, the open internet. I believe that in this sense, uh, that multi-stakeholder model which is used in Nigeria or in Brazil or in Great Britain is a perfect example how we should further uh, uh, first communicate this message to our citizens and second, 
build a certain uh, build a certain momentum for the Russian internet to develop. On the other hand, I, I do agree with uh, Leslie that uh, these principles, no matter how beautiful they are, and with Robert, by the way, they are still, in a sense, unattain uh, unattain unattainable. This is an ideal we should uh, uh, go to or just uh, strive for. But with all this cultural, as we've just seen, and uh, psychological mental differences between different states it's hard to imagine how these principles might be uh, realized or imposed universally and in this sense yes I would agree with Robert that and with Leslie that what is acceptable acceptable in uh, uh, United Kingdom may not necessarily be uh, that acceptable in Russia or in China or in Nigeria. And this is a very important factor because what we can see, I'm finishing, this, I'm concluding, yes, what we can see so far is that uh, there is a certain set of European values which uh, uh, certain uh, organizations or individuals try to impose universally. And this is a very uh, delicate situation. I don't know, Robert. Do you want to react, or <laughs> you know, I know. Uh, so, and uh, he speaks uh, Russian also, and uh, but uh, maybe not all. All, all of them, so you know, are, are quite understandable. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, uh, and the development of uh, civil society, uh, internet is the best uh, thing that uh, helps uh, the, the formation of uh, civil society. If uh, before we have been speaking about the civil society, it was quite hard to speak about that in Russia. But uh, the model we have, uh, it's, as it seems to me, this is something uh, that the uh, Internet you know, creates an opportunity to each person in Russia to express freely and to take part uh, in all you know, communities, even in political rallies, to go to the protest rallies in streets and to express their views uh, in uh, mass media and in blogs. Uh, I think that a process that is taking place in Russia, uh, the formation of democratic state, uh, it cannot be done overnight. Uh, or it cannot be uh, done as a, as a flash. So it, uh, it is a, a process. Uh, we are accumulating the, the knowledge and the uh, attitude of uh, authorities is changing. That's why the civil uh, society is developing and Internet is something that is creating the infrastructure for the work with the civil society. As uh, lawmakers, uh, we want to transform, uh, transform the energy of civil society uh, into the uh, a real possibility of their participation, full participation in Internet, and uh, 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 enable them also to take part to, to uh, improve their life level and the education in all other fields. Thank you. Um, you first, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I can take all four questions now, but. Um. Uh, I won't hear it, right? Um, my name is Jonathan Zook, and I'm with the Association for Competitive Technology. We represent small uh, ICT companies. Uh, a question that keeps coming into my mind in all of these discussions is what is the ultimate objective? Um, without a target objective, it seems like it would be difficult to come up with what the ideal path to that objective is. Is the, is the objective to increase trust so that more people will want to go online? Is that the problem that we're identifying? Is the objective to decrease cybercrime or fraud and, and what 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 exactly is the objective because otherwise this idea of coming up with best practices or principles is very abstract and I think that if we're trying to actually find our way toward a solution there might be practical answers to philosophical questions if the outcome is meant to be a practical one thank you I think with that one I'll go back to Jamie yeah that's a great challenge I think there's a number of practical objectives that we're after here um, one is that we do need a framework for international cooperation on cybercrime, and for example, uh, and that requires a degree of consensus about what is a cybercrime and a, a framework around which to do that, and there's various competing views on what that should be. But actually achieving international mechanisms that allow law enforcement to cooperate 
and there's some metrics we can develop around that. Um, we're working on one in the UK in terms, simply in terms of how many um, uh, investigations just end up in dry holes because we can't progress that international dimension. So that's one objective. Um, I think there's some economic objectives here. If you talk to the industry, well, you are uh, associated with industry. You know, they're looking for um, a level of alignment that makes it easier for multinational companies to be offering products and services, you know, without uh, enormous costs associated with slightly different regimes in different countries. So that's an important objective. And then on the core international security, uh, we the objective there, frankly, is to stop um, um, the competition that is going on within states, particularly in the national security uh, region, escalating into uncontrolled uh, real-world conflict. You know, along li lines of you know many traditional um, arms control or security agreements. That's a clear objective. Did that answer your question, more or less? Thank you. Uh, Valentina from Bosnia. I think uh, uh, that uh, I'm very scared when people talk about morality. I'm very scared when we can confuse culture with tradition. And I think that if you talk about scalability, the individual user should be your minimum unity who need to be protected and in trust, but not paternalistic. You know, a single user, a single person in a country as Russia, as Pakistan, as Italy, and the so-called democratic Western country need to have the same rights. And I cannot really, I fear the risk uh, when we talk about uh, different differences between cultures. Is the majority define the cultures? I think that we need to protect and to ensure the minority can be free and express their right and use internet. Minority are the, the person that need to have trust because minority are the most at risk. This is, I think, a very, very basic. And when you talk about scalability, the damage that a single person can do uh, cannot be uh, compared to the, the damage that a company, a criminal organization can do. But when you talk about undesirable, acceptable, I, I agree with Dick, it's pretty paternalistic. What is undesirable? Which is the limit between uh, the freedom of uh, erotics and the porn? Who is defining it? So I think that uh, the Western so-called democratic country, which are pretty conservative in my experience when we come to user rights, and the a uh, new democratic or hoping democratic country should bear in mind that their citizens are the minority too and their minority need to be protect and trust because they are their citizens thank you anyone in particular you would like to re have reacting to everybody from Nigeria, they was talking about morality to the UK and about scalability and the undesirability to Russian that uh, forgot pussy riot. Okay, Mary, can I start with you? Oh, you have your own. You want my mic or? I'm not okay. getting in the way. <laughs> All right. Um, just as we we have it in the real world. That's exactly what we are talking about in the cyberspace. The truth is that in protecting the, the individual citizen and raising up morality, you are protecting the individual citizen. And who and who should be involved in, the, in this protection? That's why we are talking about multi-stakeholder, so that the individual user the civil society, the individual user will be a civil society person. The individual user can be a, a student in a university, the academia. It could be a lecturer. But your right is being trampled upon and blanketed because somebody within the society is behaving badly. So it could be a blanket perception. It could be a blanket blocking, and which we have experienced. And that's why we are saying that, well, 
um, do we launder the, the individual uh, bad behavior, uh, uh, the bad guy on the, on the net? How do we bring the bad guy out from the bad behavior so that the internet will be open? Because the, the truth is that more people would like to, to gag or close the, or trample upon privacy and rights if there's no trust. So in order to build trust, and I agree with Leslie that what they call, uh, what they look at as their own behavior, bad behavior in, in UK might not necessarily be, uh, uh, what I look at as bad behavior in Nigeria might not necessarily be bad behavior in UK. But in one form or the other, the government has its own rule that they have set for criminality. So who was the rule meant for? The individual at individual level has what the individual considers as moral, uh, uh, moral behavior. Who, 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 would, uh, who would be uh, concerned about that moral behavior? So in totality, all of us are involved. The government is involved, individual, everybody. So, and that's, that calls for, and I, I think that was the spirit of, that's the spirit of the IGF, so that it's open enough when we discuss at that level, when we call everybody together to the discussion, I can express myself to say, well, what I'm doing actually, this is why I'm doing it. And the government will say, no, we are concerned about what we are, because we are bringing a bad image to our country. So I think whether you scale it to, to, to government or the individual, the individual and the government, they are all concerned. Do you want to react, Leslie? Yeah, um, I apologize. I don't think I've been very clear on scalability. Um, so so what, I, what I meant was scalability of processes dealing with unacceptable behavior or unlawful behavior. Um, so Robert shared an amazing statistic with us earlier that 15 million Russians are, are using state services, uh, which is just an amazing number. If 10% of those wanted to complain about something, is there a scalable process to deal with 1.5 million complaints or whatever number? Um, so, so I'm with you on the individual user. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm saying is, from my operations background, how do you scale people wanting a complaint about unacceptable or unlawful behavior dealt with? Uh, and we very much need to factor that thinking uh, into this conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that there are more questions, and I'm pretty confident that a few more of you would like to react to, um, to the questions from the room. Um, but we have to try to get this discussion a bit further. Um, we had two focus points, or we have two focus points, which are presently on the screen. And the first one is the question, can we come up with standards of acceptable or un preferably unacceptable behavior? Um, and the second one is, what are the roles and responsibilities of business, civil uh, organizations, and governments in developing such an approach. Um, over the last few years, I've been in many discussions on cybercrime and the problem that we're all facing that the internet is borderless and criminal law often is national. Um, as far as I've noticed, I don't think we've come much further than that conclusion. Um, and I think the initiative uh, from the UK government stems from the fact that we see um, online crime increasing and we see that it affects the trust uh, that people have in the internet and thus we see the effect that it can have on eco economic development for instance uh, we saw the example from Nigeria so I, I understand why we want to do this um, but how do we get this further um, like Leslie said it's good to have a discussion it's a difficult goal to obtain. Um, I think many countries already have a problem with defining what is internet crime within the borders of, its, of their own country. Uh, we've seen quite a few examples of um, different approaches that have led to uh, partial solutions. Um, but doing this on the global scale seems quite a challenge. Who can, who can I give the floor from the panel on trying to get us a bit further on this subject? Or we conclude that 
this was a nice idea, but it's not going to work. Yeah, Dixie. This probably isn't what you want to hear, but I can give an example of how we don't do it. Quite neutral in what I want to okay, hear. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I think we need to not do it by uh, creating a convention among a small group of countries and then going out and encouraging other countries to sign on to it by um, making, uh, putting it in with trade deals, etc., as has happened with the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention. I think that's not the right approach. So I think if we do want to move forward, I think it's clear that all countries that we, where we want it to apply need to be involved from the beginning and that we need to involve all stakeholders. That, that, to me, it seems that about killed the idea, but... Sorry. <laughs> Flavio. Uh, based on the Brazilian experience, I, I have to say that the multi-stakeholder approach is essential for the success of uh, any initiative aiming at definition of norms of acceptable behavior. And I don't think that trust on the Internet can uh, be achieved only by legislation and by actions that are implemented by law enforcement agencies. So this covers only part of the problem. Acceptable behavior is much more a matter of a cultural behavior, not only a legal issue. Uh, and the Internet evolves too fast. Uh, legislation, especially international treaties, uh, will solve only a small part of the problem. They are very hard to negotiate and will never cope with the pace of the evolution of the Internet. Uh, the solution we seek to promote and enhance interest cannot hinder evolution. This is one of the core principles we must protect. So therefore, we need a comprehensive solution. Uh, since legislation alone does not solve the problem, we need a multi-stakeholder approach so that all stakeholders in the society discuss and agree on uh, general principles and policies and implement them in their respective roles. So even if this is very hard to achieve, we need to make an effort to agree internationally on a set of general principles regarding use and governance of the Internet. There are already models we can consider, the, the 10 key principles for the Internet's rights and principles coalition, the Brazilian one, and so on. And this is the basis uh, for any further discuss discussion. Uh, these principles will set up the safeguards we need, and uh, we cannot ac enforce acceptable behavior by whatever binding or non-binding means if we do not know which are the core principles we have to respect. So you're saying let's start from the principles, and in yeah. fact in Brazil you did. Yeah. Um, if I understood Leslie correctly, um, she said, well, let's not just have rights and principles, but let's add responsibilities. Um, that sounds like a good idea. But now Dixie says, if we want to go on with this, we have to have a discussion with all countries and all stakeholders. That's a pretty big room to have a discussion in. I think there's one in Washington, there might be another one somewhere else, but this is definitely not big enough for all countries and, and they will not come. But so is, do, you, do you share that idea that you have to start with everybody at the table or can yeah. a smaller group take the initiative and lead well, by We can use a model like uh, IGF. We can have uh, national events and then regional ones and then international ones. It's uh, of course impossible that all stakeholders sit at the same table at once. Uh, but we can do it in some hierarchical way and then filter ideas and bring them to the international discussion. But uh, yes, I think I agree with you. With her. We need uh, all stakeholders at international level discussing together. So Robert, do you think that that might work if, um, if we bring it into the IGF and we try to get as much countries or as many countries and as many stakeholders at a very huge table and try to come up with principles, rights, and responsibilities. <laughs> you know, uh, to me, we can define uh, many different obligations and responsibilities, uh, but they will not be binding. And if they will not be binding, so they will not be realized at all. The issue is that, as a practice shows, that self-regulation and the culture of behavior in the Internet so will mainly depend on the cultural level of society and education inside this or that society. These are the main institutions and the concepts that are present in each society and we have to increase the level of these uh, traditions. We have a proverb uh, or either phraseologically 
So if everything if uh, if everything is not everything is not prohibited, then it is permitted. It means that so and uh, uh, and the, the, the le limits between the uh, uh, moral and non-moral behavior can be set. Uh, I think that there are the uh, things that can be absolutely common for all countries. Uh, I think that those that are unacceptable in any country of the world, of course. In these fields, I think that we should negotiate uh, even at the level of legislation. And of course, uh, today we are very frustrated uh, in uh, creating the laws that would uh, describe or would uh, uh, provide uh, a right, uh, the, the same rights that are online, the same rights also for offline uh, mode. Uh, I think that this has the, uh, the limits, because if we will have this rule in our country, it does not mean that it will also very prettily work in other country. Therefore, if we are talking about such specific documents uh, which have some Binding force for making this or that action, I think um, it should it should be it should it should have some differences. Thank you. Correctly, um, your your main response was no, that will not work because we we will have to agree on the major uh, problems and incorporate them into le national legislation, into laws, and, and not into uh, non-binding suggestions or policies. Yeah? I will give you one example. I will give you an example from our experience. Uh, we have had a lot of discussions Im about making changes to the legislation, so we have very serious uh, debates. Uh, about the internet rights, uh, we have the civil society which is actively participating in that, but practically the uh, majority of uh, citizens of our country, there is a consensus that in internet we have to struggle mainly against uh, drugs, child pornography, and the instigation to suicide acts uh, and other things. Uh, you know, these items, uh, they are less numerous. Uh, and on these items, uh, there is a larger consensus of the majority. I mean, I think this can be used, uh, this practice, at international level, so between the governments and between the states. Uh, uh, I can tell you very plainly that this is unacceptable for a normal state. So all of us, we have to aspire to have the common rules, uh, I think, that for these major items, uh, but not all. But in some of them, we can find, uh, you know, some common, uh, uh, common points, and uh, this can be a good uh, progress. It's very much on the unlawful and illegal content side. F oh, yes, I was just going to ask. From the room. Yeah, you were first. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Um, don't you think, um, don't you think that uh, when we are trying to um, have a consensus about what is acceptable behavior, we are talking about cultures and we are talking about something that has been built in our societies since long ago. While now we are trying to build acceptable behavior for a new environment, which is the internet. And don't you see that we have to wait and to see what this cultural environment will be creating as acceptable behavior? Because it's a different nature from our society. We are trying to build something to the internet out of a traditional society totally different with varieties of cultural wa culture, while the internet will be having, I think, its own culture. Don't, it, don't you think that it's better to focus our efforts on getting a consensus up, um, on the international level about the issue of the necessity to adopt cyber crimes legislations and regulations because this one can be applied and can be implemented in the near future. 
I'm not saying we, we, we don't want to talk about acceptable behavior because some legislation are, uh, has built, uh, have built their own um, rules upon behavior in society. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a remark, we don't necessarily have to focus on those things that we suspect that are not the same in any country, but for instance, I think using a botnet to attack, to attack infrastructure will probably be unacceptable behavior in most countries, yeah. Ladies first, yeah, Mary. All right, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, what do we mean by unacceptable behavior? Is there a difference between the offline and online? We build our consensus, we build our uh, whatever or, or agreement based on the offline acceptable behaviors and based on our cultural differences. And today, if there's, if there's a breach of any cultural uh, behavior or rules, and uh, what, which, which, which law, which um, um, uh, standard will apply, I think that's what we are trying to see because of the, the new environment we have we call the internet. But the, the truth is that if we, if we can uh, agree on uh, standards at the top level, then countries on their own would also use that as a, a benchmark to build their own individual cultural behavior or acceptable behavior as the case may be. That's, that's what I think that the, the, the whole discussion, the whole um, process is all about. And uh, because of the way the internet has developed and because of the openness, so that would, at the end of the day, it's not a question of a country determining for another country. There will be a, live, a, li a high level agreement and from there it will trickle down. That's the, what I think. Check. Um, I don't want to sort of lose the point I think you were making earlier about uh, the value or otherwise of a multi-stakeholder approach to setting principles and so on. Um, my view is that that's an extremely valuable process um, and that if we can develop a mechanism in this forum to make that happen, that will be enormously useful. I think we're actually operating at a number of levels. I think we do need to have government-to-government -government debate and agree things and have treaties and all that kind of stuff in various areas um, because that's what makes things binding. And the problem is that process is incredibly slow. Our objections to some of the proposals for codes of conducts and treaties is that they're premature, not that they're a, a bad idea uh, per se. I think that the, the multi-stakeholder voice can really help to accelerate that process. I think it's a value in its own right because having uh, common principles um, is of value even if they're not binding. So I think we, it's of direct use. And finally, and this sort of answers the cultural point that the lady raised, who raised just then, I mean, there will be occasions when smaller groups of countries say, well, we can't all agree universally, but we're going to agree. And I mean, that obviously happens a lot in Europe, and that's what makes trade within Europe in the e-economy so much easier. So I think in some cases, countries will be making a choice. Do I go along with this perhaps higher set of standards? Um, because that enables um, uh, economic opportunities that wasn't my otherwise exist, or do I kind of wait and do a lowest common denominator approach? So in all, all three of those spaces, the sort of regional, smaller numbers of groups, the international, and the sort of civil society, I think they can all three feed into each other. The missing ingredient for me at the moment is that civil society, IGF style, a statement of principles which we as governments and can use as a kind of aspirational reference point. So I'd be very keen to uh, see a mechanism to take that forward. Okay. Thank you for that, Jamie. Um, we're running out of time. I've been signaled, which probably means that I have to cut you all short now, but I'll, I'll just take one more uh, question from the room and one final remark from the panel, and then I'll try I don't know yet know how, but I'll try to sum this up and see if we can push it a bit forward. Um, I think I'll go to you because you've been flagging me for quite some time. Um, uh, my name is John Bullard and I come from a company called Identrust in, in the private sector. And we do run a global trust network 
which is based upon the law of contract, private contract between members of a scheme rather than relying upon government to provide the schemes for us. And, and that seems to work very well in the commercial sector for promoting commerce globally. So I would ask the panel to consider these sorts of options, whether you are in Russia, whether you're in Nigeria, United Kingdom or Brazil, the same set of private contractual arrangements do, do exist and do actually work today. Thank you. Famous last words from the panel. Any volunteers? Yeah, Robert was first. Okay, I'll let one. Yeah. Just very briefly, I would like to say, it seems to me, it seems to me, I would like to say, this uh, approach has the right to exist and it can be effective in the case if uh, this or that social network would just set uh, relative uh, rules of behavior but in their own field. For example, we have the social network. It, it is called in Russian Vkontakte, in contact. Uh, when people from all former Soviet Union say they go there and they talk, they communicate, but if in general, we take the in general, the internet uh, uh, space, internet territory, so that will not uh, be effective, that will not work, because in any case, uh, uh, some uh, uh, non-cultural behavior for some uh, young uh, people, it's something that is inside their mind, so something that is already programmed, so it's the algorithm of their, you know, uh, actions. Therefore, here we are again coming to the issues of defining the limits, the frontiers, uh, that uh, and uh, what is permitted and what is not permitted. Uh, and this is something that can be, uh, you know, uh, defined only by legislation or the law. I think that, you know, I do not know fully. So, for example, for, for if, for example, a child, he gets uh, a message with threatening, with threat. And uh, 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 unfortunately, this happens. Uh, maybe this is, uh, you know, some non-cultural behavior. I would like just, uh, for example, to see the man who is sending a message with threatening, uh, so can be taken accountable for his uh, action. For example, uh, in uh, in some cases, so it can be just you know seen as a norm. So if someone has insulted or some someone has started to threaten or threaten to publish your personal data or he has got illegal access to your personal data, so this is the full anarchy and the full, and full uh, neglect of uh, rights and and, and uh, of, uh, of, of, of people. Therefore, I think that uh, in order to uh, you know to see this the formation of, uh, of, of 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 general rules, so I think that we should lay down the foundations upon which we can build uh, this uh, construction. Because yes, uh, if we talk about some limited space that can work, but if we go out of that uh, you know space, so uh, it will be uh, difficult, and we should find a consensus. Thank you. Very much. Um, I'll try to sum this up. Um, we've seen the examples and we've heard quite a few statements um, supporting the position that in order to be able to enforce, we will need laws on the most serious issues, the si most serious aspects of cybercrime. Uh, there seems to be support as well for discussion on an international discussion, multi-stakeholder, on a set of principles as long as we base them on human rights and uh, there was also quite I think quite a bit of support for not only rights and principles but also responsibilities and the IGF might be a good environment to start this discussion um, I think there are quite a few people doubt if this is really in the end going to lead to something that we can use in a relatively short time. But it's a no good alternative to especially international legislation because that is a very time consuming um, uh, work. And I think uh, already at the national level, we, s we sometimes see that we have to make as, as, sec as a sector, we have to come to an arrangement before that legislation is in place. Um, that's about what I can make from it. If, the, if I miss something very important, this is the last chance of my panel to correct me.
I would not like to correct you, just to add uh, something that uh, Mary has uh, brought, that after we agreed on an international level on general principles and norms of uh, good behavior, we then must bring the discussion down to the national level. And each country has its own cultural and legal situation. And yeah. each country may adapt according to its needs. Yeah. Thank you, the, 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 the solutions, yeah. Oh, another correction. Listen. So the other thing I also heard was support for a multi-stakeholder approach to this issue. Yes. Um, and particularly to hear somebody from government talking that I think is, yeah. is good because this recognizes this is a, a, a difficult conversation and therefore having business and end user input and civil society input into that is going to be incredibly important. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to have a round of applause for my panel and thank you all for attending and for your contributions.